Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, I uh, have one very brief thing at the top, um, and I'll also note that I have a bit of a hard out, so I'll be keeping an eye on the clock, and I will need to wrap when I need to wrap, and if I don't get to you, I'm sorry. Uh, so first, we are deeply concerned by reports that Iran is planning to deliver hundreds of ballistic missiles to Russia, and we continue to communicate with our European partners and allies regarding potential measures we may take. We've been warning of the deepening security partnership between Russia and Iran since the onset of Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine. This partnership threatens European security and illustrates how Iran's destabilizing influence reaches beyond the Middle East and around the world. As we and our partners have made clear, both at the G7 and at the NATO summit this summer, Together, we are prepared to deliver a swift and severe response if Iran were to move forward with the transfer of ballistic missiles, which would, in our view, uh, represent a dramatic escalation in Iran's support for Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine. Uh, Iranian officials also continue to deny providing any UAVs to Russia when evidence is plain for the world to see. Russia has used these UAVs in relentless attacks against the civilian population in Ukraine, against civilian infrastructure, and this duplicity is only the latest reminder to the international community that the Iranian regime lacks any credibility. During uh, his campaign, Iranian President uh, Pavestrian claimed he wanted to moderate Iran's policies and engage with the world, and we have said we have no expectation his election will lead to a fundamental change in Iran's direction. And this pending transfer of missiles, if the reports are accurate, if, uh, is further evidence or a continuation of Iran's destabilizing behavior. We will continue to judge Iran's leadership by their actions, not their words. Uh, with that, um, Myra or Sean, any of you want to kick us off? Please. Um, no, it's fine. Um, thanks, Vedan. So can I ask you what's the latest on um, U.S. Uh, expectation on Iran's response on Israel following Hania's killing? So, uh, look, I, as should be no surprise to you, Hamara, I'm not going to get ahead of uh, assessments or speculate um, intelligence or uh, operational matters from up here. Uh, what uh, I can say is what you've heard President Biden, Secretary Blinken, and others echo from up here before is that we are committed to helping Israel uh, defend itself, and we have uh, put robust military capabilities in the region uh, to do just that. Uh, but at the same time, we continue to work diplomatically to prevent any major escalation of this conflict. Those are our goals. Um, as you all have seen, no doubt, the secretary over the past uh, a week or so has been uh, engaged in calls with his counterparts, uh, discussing uh, not just the need to uh, finalize a ceasefire deal, but also continuing to uh, work so that um, there can be de-escalation. We obviously don't want to see any kind of uh, attack or response happen in the first place. Do you have any indications uh, recently that, you know, your efforts are actually working and there might be a more subdued response from Iran? I, I'm just not going to get into uh, intelligence ass assessments or our um, operational assessments from up here. Are the ceasefire talks uh, that you called for August 15th, are they still going to go ahead after what Hamas said last night? So I'm aware of those comments from Hamas, and we fully expect uh, talks to move forward, as they should. Uh, all negotiators should return to the table and bring this deal to conclusion. Uh, it is, uh, in our view, time for Hamas to release the hostages, which, uh, as you all know, include American citizens, and bring relief uh, to the people of Gaza uh, under the deal, which continues to be a lot on the table, and we'll continue to work that with uh, regional partners and allies. Right. When you say you fully expect the talks to go ahead, if they say they're not taking part, are you going to have the talks without them, or are you trying to bring them on board? As I said, I will just leave it at the fact that we uh, expect these talks to move forward as they should. I'm not going to... But will uh, you have it without them? Uh, I'm just not going to uh, speculate beyond that. We're, we've seen reports of those comments from Hamas, and we fully expect these talks to continue to move forward. And who in, who in U.S. view at the moment, who, um, who is the biggest obstacle to achieving this ceasefire and hostage deal? So uh, I'm not going to color it uh, one way or the other, but let's not, uh, let's not forget that um, it was 
early last week. Uh, the Prime Minister of Israel immediately welcomed this initi initiative and uh, confirmed that the Israeli team will be there and they'll be prepared to finalize the details of implementing uh, the deal. Uh, we uh, also, in coordination, uh, we believe our partners in Egypt and Qatar are emphasizing to Hamas that uh, the onus is on them to uh, agree to a ceasefire. Uh, we believe that there has been headway made, but we need to finalize this agreement, uh, continue to close uh, and bridge some gaps. Uh, but we believe that an agreement is possible, and that's something that we're going to continue to work between the parties. Uh, John, sure. Can we continue in the Middle East? Um, uh, the strike uh, on a school in yeah. Gaza. Um, I think the, la the latest toll I saw from, from officials uh, in Gaza, uh, the health minister, is 93 dead. Israel uh, has said that uh, it identified 31 um, militants in this word. I mean, how... How much do you, how, how much uh, credence do you put in this? I mean, do you think that, um, I mean, even if 31 militants were killed, that means another 60 plus uh, non militants uh, died in this. Uh, what's the nature of, uh, of the assessment that the U.S. has, both on the facts on the ground and, and, and whether there's any level of concern on this? So, first, Sean, let me just say we are deeply concerned about this weekend's horrific incident uh, on the Al Tabin school in Gaza City that killed uh, a, a number of people sheltering in place. And our um, hearts go out to the families of those who lost loved ones and we are uh, praying for a speedy recovery for those who have been injured. Uh, we have been clear, uh, both to our partners in Israel, that uh, every possible effort needs to be taken to minimize the impact of uh, civilian casualties. But again, um, as we have seen uh, in this instance, as our Israeli partners indicated, that there were uh, a number of uh, uh, Hamas militants um, uh, using civilian infrastructure, in this case a school, um, to, to hide amongst that. And so we condemn and deplore any attempt by terrorists to hide among civilians in or under protected facilities. Uh, that needs to stop. Sites uh, such as schools may lose their protected status under international law when they're used by combatants. Uh, but that certainly does not, um, uh, that does not uh, take away from the moral and strategic imperative that our partners in Israel have uh, to take every possible step to make sure that uh, the loss of civilian life impacts to civilians um, is not mitigated. And that's something we'll continue to stress apparently. On this specific uh, strike and incident, uh, we continue to be in close coordination with our partners in, e I in the IDF and have continued to solicit uh, more information uh, around it, but I don't have any information beyond that. Sure, on the more information, is yeah. is there any indication that US weapons were involved in this? Uh, I there wouldn't speculate on that. I would let the IDF speak to any operations they may or may not have undertaken. And just, um, I mean, they're saying that 31 uh, militants were there. And, and you said that you're, you're seeking information. I'm not you personally, but the, the United States is seeking yeah. information from the IDF. Uh, what, what are you looking for? I mean, are you looking for them to, to verify that those 31, that the names match up with people they're targeting? Look, Sean, I'm not going to get into the specifics of the um, information in the, that we solicit. What I can just say is that we are engaged with our partners in the IDF uh, about this generally. Uh, let's not lose sight of the fact that uh, ultimately here, Israel does have, uh, uh, we support its ability to defend itself and we support its ability to take out um, uh, Hamas terrorists. Uh, to continue to hold to account those that were involved in the horrific October 7th terrorist attack. But again, uh, we also will continue to stress that there is a moral and strategic imperative uh, for uh, Israel to minimize its impacts on civilians and to minimize civilian casualties. Uh, and lastly, the last point I'll make on this is that we are even having the reason we're having this conversation is because uh, Hamas has a clear track record of continuing to uh, co locate itself uh, among civilian infrastructure, uh, use civilians as human shields. Uh, that's not hyperbole. There is a clear track record of that. Sure. Can I just follow sure. up on that? Sure. Tom, go I mean, are you satisfied with the credibility of what the Israelis are saying about? I mean, because you quoted their claim about a number of militants being in the building. Um, and they published pictures and names of people they've said have been, in their words, eliminated. Are you happy with the credibility of that information? So uh, I'm not going to uh, speak to any satisfaction or not, Tom. What I will say is that we have a robust relationship, uh, a robust information rela sharing relationship with our Israeli partners. Uh, and when things like this um, happen uh, over the course of this conflict, we have uh, uh, solicited uh, more and additional information from the IDF, and that uh, relationship will continue. Uh, what I can
can say to, broad. To I'm just not going to speak to uh, uh, the the specifics uh, in, in which way, way we work with them, but this is a close and robust relationship. And when we have or require additional information, we're not hesitant to ask our partners in Israel for it. Uh, and that will continue to be the case. I mean, it's fairly strong evidence that at least three of the people they've published pictures of since Saturday and named were not killed in that incident, were killed in incidents before. That's according, according to Euromed Human Rights Monitor, who's been going through the list. I mean, one of them, Muntar, da, uh, Muntar or Montessar Daher, who Israel described as an Islamic Jihad operative. Um, I mean, you can go on Facebook and see the picture of him uh, being mourned as being dead was from the day before, um, with a relative or a friend saying that was in an airstrike on an apartment west of Gaza City, so a completely different incident. I mean, do you verify these things? Tom, I will uh, let the IDF speak to its own operations, and as I said, we have a very close information sharing relationship with our partners uh, in Israel. I'll let them speak to their own operations, but uh, again, there is a clear, uh, uh, provable track record of Hamas using civilians as human shields, co-locating itself amongst um, civilian infrastructure. Uh, that does not uh, minimize the moral and strategic imperative that Israel has to minimize my civilian casualties, but they uh, do have a clear track record of doing this. And as I said, protected facilities may lose their status when they are utilized by combatants in this way. But there's also a moral and strategic imperative for the information to be accurate and credible after the fact, because it may or may not of, justify of course, an international humanitarian law. So I think, you know, what Sean was talking about effectively was the issue of proportionality. If you have many, many dozens of civilians killed, there has to be very strong and clear and overwhelming evidence that those killed... Uh, created a risk um, that Israel attacking them gave them a clear military advantage. That's what international humanitarian so, law says. So if, if it is emerging that some of these people were actually killed in previous incidents, there's not even an accurate um, account of people that were killed. There, there is, of course... There is, of course, a moral and strategic imperative uh, to make sure that any uh, operation that's being conducted uh, is rooted in um, salient, accurate, and most up-to-date information. That would be the case not just for Israel, but for any country um, that has a military. But again, as it relates to the details around this, I'm just will not. I'm not going to get into the operations, and I will let our partners in Israel speak to it. Can I, can I follow up on that particular sure. incident? Um, so, uh, Sean has asked you whether, if you know, U.S. made weapons were used. There is reporting, actually, CNN report that U.S. made small diameter bombs were indeed used in the school attack. So I just want to understand, is the State Department trying to verify that information or not? So, I'm, Humaira, we have a strong... Uh, these are U.S. made weapons and you regularly send these weapons to Israel. So while I understand it's an IDF operation, there is reporting that the weapons used are U.S. supplied. So I'm wondering if there is a systematic effort at this building to monitor how U.S.-made weapons are being used. Of course there is, which we have talked there about is. a number of times in this briefing room. There are, of course, a number of tools and levers at the United States' disposal to continue to ensure that U.S. security assistance is used within appropriate uh, confines of international humanitarian law. And so far, We've can you talked say about, after 10 months I, of war, I'm certainly are, not going to speak to the ongoing and deliberative process, Humaira. In accordance with law? Israel is a country in which we have a robust security partnership with that is, should be no surprise to you. I'm not going to speak to um, ongoing and deliberative processes. But as we do with any country in which we have a security relationship, there are tools at our disposal uh, to ensure that uh, the use of security systems are consistent with international humanitarian law. That is an ongoing, around-the-clock effort uh, that continue, and it continues to be rooted in a lot of things. It's in close coordination with our embassies and consulates. It's in close coordination with um, uh, NGOs and humanitarian organizations and civil society, and that continues to be the case. As it relates to this specific incident, Humaira, I don't have any assessment to offer. I am not going to speak to uh, Israeli operations from up here. Right. So since we're at it, um, can I ask about Netza Yehuda, the Israeli battalion that um, you guys needed extra information? And in the end, U.S. decided to clear um, that battalion and they're going to be able to receive U.S. security assistance. Can you tell us what accountability measures they've taken that, um, that basically made you 
take this decision that you're satisfied? Sure, Hamira. So uh, just a little bit of to take a step back, we made public in April. Uh, the Department of State found that after a careful review that incidents of gross violations of human rights by two units of the uh, Israeli Defense Forces and two civilian authority units had been uh, effectively remediated. Uh, the department has for for the past several months, uh, continued a process to review an additional unit to evaluate new information provided by the government of Israel. And after thoroughly reviewing that information, we've determined that the that violations by this unit um, have been effectively remediated, consistent with the Leahy process. Uh, in the crux of that information, Hamira, was that uh, two of the soldiers for whom uh, military prosecutors had concluded further action uh, uh, was necessary were swiftly removed from their combat positions, have since left the military, and are ineligible to serve in the reserves. Additionally, the uh, IDF has taken several steps to avoid a recurrence of incidents. It has enhanced screening requirements for uh, personnel recruited uh, into that battalion, and it has uh, put in place new control mechanisms and training efforts uh, around these uh, around trainings for ind individuals who join, um, uh, join that battalion. Specifically, soldiers now receive a two-week educational seminar unique to the battalion, and uh, conduct is documented. But uh, again, I will let our partners in Israel speak uh, to more specifically to their operations. Will these individuals be prosecuted in Israel? That is uh, up for, that's not for the United States to speak to, that's for, uh, that's a question for the Israeli justice Have system. Have you sought that from them? Uh, again, that's a question for the Israeli justice system, that's not something I would speak yes, to from up here. Yes, but for Israeli settlers, for example, in the West Bank, you have taken action when they haven't prosecuted them. So, are you applying the same criteria to this one or not? So uh, these are uh, a little bit different circumstances, Humaira. Uh, let me just say broadly that when it comes to any actions, whatever they may be, if we find them to be destabilizing uh, or contradictory to our stated goal of a, a two-state solution and wanting stability into the region, uh, we of course uh, won't hesitate to take, act, take action, but I'm not going to uh, speculate further on this. Uh, our partners in the IDF can speak uh, more specifically about uh, individuals in this unit. Uh, Jillian, go ahead. Is the, the Biden administration still anticipating the potential for some kind of Iranian kinetic attack on Israel I in think the coming days? That was her first question in uh, speaking to that. Uh, was it not? What, I don't know. Uh, Sorry, I wouldn't well, have asked if I realized. It, it, I think it was one of the first questions uh, whom Ira asked, uh, but I will just say again that uh, I'm certainly not going to get into uh, intelligence assessments from up here. What we're focused on is uh, continuing to uh, de-escalate uh, diplomatically. Our hope and our intent is uh, for uh, to make sure that uh, an attack doesn't happen. You've seen for the past uh, number of weeks the secretary be engaged in conversations with his counterparts and leaders in, in the region, and that'll continue continue to be the case. But also, um, as I said to Humaira, we are committed to uh, defending Israel and um, have put robust military capabilities in the region uh, to do so should we need it. Um, on Friday, Microsoft revealed that Iranian government-backed cyber hackers had targeted a U.S. presidential campaign back in June. Then on Saturday, the Trump campaign said they had been hacked by Iranian cyber hackers following the same, later the same day Politico said they had been in receipt of hacked emails um, that had internal Trump campaign documents and they believed those were uh, coming from an Iranian source. I know you're not going to comment on a campaign issue. I'm not looking for that. What I'm looking for is Oh, can you comment more broadly on the threat of Iranian sure. interference in the election? So this is something that we've raised uh, for some time, Julian. We've raised concerns that uh, Iranian uh, cyber actors have been seeking to influence uh, elections around the world, including uh, those happening in the United States. These latest attempts to interfere uh, in U.S. elections are nothing new for the Iranian regime, which um, uh, from our vantage point has undermined democracies or attempted to uh, for, um, for many years now. Uh, 
specifically, uh, I'd refer you to the Office of the Director of the National Intelligence for further details on uh, recent reports about the natures of this kind of malicious interference and uh, colleagues at the FBI and the Department of Homeland Security can speak to what steps are being taken to combat domestic and election influence by hostile, hostile foreign governments more broadly. As you know, uh, as someone who covers this department closely, that is not a, a line of effort that, uh, that exists at the State Department. Can you talk broadly about what kind of leverage the U.S. has to discourage Iran well, from even planning to For interfere? any kind of uh, malign, destabilizing activity that the Iranian regime could partake in and certainly trying to meddle and influence elections, um, that uh, I, I would certainly count that high among them. Uh, we continue to have a number of tools in our uh, tool belt to hold the Iranian regime accountable, and we won't hesitate to use them, certainly, and, and not just unilaterally, but also multilaterally through uh, entities like the G7 and otherwise. But specifically on, on actions, uh, on deterrent actions as it relates to this, I will let my colleagues at the FBI and DHS um, speak to it. Thank you. Um, Alex, go ahead. Thank you, very much. Kramer, before that, may I go back to your opening statement, please? Sure. You said that you are concerned about the reports that Iran is planning to deliver hundreds of ballistic missiles to Russia. Last week, uh, there, there were reports that EU COM, US uh, European Command, citing U US intelligence, uh, told the Congress that Iran has already delivered hundreds of ballistic missiles, uh, missiles to Russia. And there was also a Reuters report citing U European intelligence that there are hundreds of you know, uh, Russians are being trained in Iran. Do you have any confidence in U.S. intelligence finding, and what are you going to do about it? So, of course, we have confidence uh, in our intelligence assessments. I'm certainly not going to get into them from up here. I think, Alex, to widen the aperture, what we're talking about when I raise things like this is the continued uh, deepening security partnership between Iran and Russia, which... Uh, continues to be incredibly concerning. It is not just a threat to uh, European security, it's a threat to Middle East security, but it also uh, shows that uh, Iran's destabilizing influences has reached beyond the Middle East region, and that would be should be of concern to uh, the entire world, and that's what we'll continue to work closely with our allies and partners on. Thank you. Uh, two questions on Ukraine. Yeah. Uh, Megan, your, 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 late, your assessment on the latest uh, on the battle of the particular the Ukrainian advancing uh, in, in, in Russian territory. So, uh, Alex, uh, I know my colleagues um, spoke a little bit about this uh, uh, earlier in the uh, last week, but I'll let uh, our partners in Ukraine speak to their own military operations. But generally speaking, we have supported uh, Ukrainian forces being able to defend themselves uh, against attacks by Russia's forces that are coming from across the border uh, to take actions to protect themselves from these attacks. That, uh, as President Biden says, uh, would be common sense. Uh, we are continuing to stay focused on making sure that that our partners in Ukraine have what they need to defend themselves from uh, Russian aggression. Uh, and ultimately, uh, the decisions about how Ukraine conducts its military operations are decisions for Ukraine to make. Uh, nothing has changed about the United States policy uh, with respects to strikes across the border. On that line, uh, uh, advisor, an advisor to President Zelensky told Washington Post last week that they have formally requested the Biden administration to allow them to use attackums uh, to hit you know, back uh, Russian uh, uh, target Russian um, uh, bases where the, the attacks are coming from, uh, you know, because they have been targeting Ukraine, you know, uh, territory without impunity. Is it time, uh, as we see Ukraine advance uh, you know, in the region, is it time to stop caring about what Putin thinks and untie Ukrainian hands? So, Alex, look, uh, I'm not going to get into private diplomatic conversations with our Ukrainian partners beyond just saying that uh, our policy hasn't changed. Can I just just very quick follow yeah, on that because sure. uh, uh, you know Putin has been uh, sort of uh, threatening a, a tough response. Says this will get a worthy response after um, what's happened in in Kursk. Uh, that was to, within the last twenty four hours, I think. Do you have any um, comment comment on what he said? Sorry, could you you couldn't Vladimir hear Putin uh, uh -huh. talked about um, a worthy response to um, what's happened in Kursk. Uh, do you have any you know, comment on what he's been saying? It's been sort of fairly threatening rhetoric. Well, uh, look, this is uh, nothing new um, for uh, Mr. Putin. Uh, over the course of this conflict, he has um, saber-rattled, used escalatory language, um, uh, 
let's not lose sight of the fact that again the only reason we are having this conversation the only reason Alex was in a in, in a point to even ask me this question or raise this issue and you're able to follow up is because uh, in February of 2022 uh, Russia uh, uh, illegally unjustly uh, uh, crossed into Ukrainian territory with an attempt to uh, subjugate its borders uh, and so really the solution here and if uh, Mr. Putin is interested in a quick uh, resolution to this would simply be for Russian forces to leave Ukraine. It could be as simple as that. Uh, Nike, go ahead. Thank you, Madam. Um, Sudan, do you have any updates on the Sudan peace talks in Geneva uh, on attendance of SAF? And is it fair to say that the talk will proceed no matter what? So, um, uh, Nike, the United States at the highest levels of our government has been clear on the urgency of a nationwide uh, secession of violence, surging of humanitarian aid to address famine in what we believe to be one of the worst humanitarian crises in the world, and building toward lasting peace in Sudan with an inclusive democratic governance that represents all Sudanese people. Um, as you all know, Secretary Blinken uh, invited leadership of the SAF and RSF, along with a range of international partners, to talks in Switzerland, which are set to begin uh, this week to achieve that cessation of violence. Uh, after extensive consultations with both parties, the RSF has accepted our inv inv invitation, and unfortunately, the SAF has not. Uh, our view is that talks will proceed with or without the SAF to develop shared action plans toward a nationwide secession of violence, opening uh, additional uh, humanitarian access, and a robust monitoring and implementation regime. That's what our focus is on, uh, but I don't have, uh, don't want to get ahead of that beyond that. How about the format? Are they proximity talks? Uh, I'm not going to uh, get ahead of, uh, of format, Nike, beyond just saying we are continuing to work towards convening those talks, and it's important for both the RSF and SAF to attend talks in, in Switzerland. It's vital to stop the fighting and to ensure humanitarian access to meet with the Sudanese people. One final question on Thailand. Yeah, um, really quickly. So last week, a U.S. expressed concern on the dissolution of Move Forward Party, and protesters gathered around the U.S. Embassy on the ground Friday. Do you have anything, any assessment on the situation on the ground and how will that affect U.S. policy toward Thailand in the future? So first, thank you. Protecting freedom of expression and the right to peaceful assembly are essential to maintaining confidence in Thai democracy, and we're monitoring protests in the area. We're calling on uh, all sides to act with restraint and to engage in constructive dialogue. Uh, I'm not going to get into private diplomatic conversations beyond that, but we have uh, uh, engaged uh, the Thai government about this, and we'll continue to do so. Camilla. Thanks. On Saudi Arabia, um the US government lifted its ban on certain weapons yep. uh, to Saudi. Um, granted that, you know, that ban was also to help wind down things in the war in Yemen. Um, the language that was used was that the department is lifting its suspension. Uh, so just understanding that this is not an expiration, this is something that was decided to be lifted now. Correct. And if lifted, does that mean we see that as uh, also playing into the strengthening of security, uh, the security relationship between the US and Saudi and also the day after plans for Gaza. How should we look at the timing? Of this? So these are these are these are separate issues, uh, Camilla. And uh, you are correct. This is not an, an expiration or something like that. This is uh, this initial decision was, is rooted in um, uh, administration policy, a decision uh, by the president, um, and that uh, continues to be the case today. Uh, if, as you know, from the earliest days of this administration, we set out to end uh, the Yemen war, uh, and when we entered office, this war was escalating. Uh, um, as part of this policy, our administration froze uh, the sale of certain classes of offensive weapons while also uh, maintaining sales of systems uh, to the kingdom required to defend itself from attack. Uh, we also have, at that point, doubled down efforts to interdict and disrupt illicit arms flows into Yemen in support of the Houthis. Um, it, we also always made clear that the freeze on certain classes of weapons was uh, conditional and it was based on Saudi Arabia's policy towards Yemen and efforts to improve civilian harm mitigation measures. 
Um, the Saudis, uh, since that time, have met their end of the deal, and we are prepared uh, to meet ours, which means uh, returning these cases uh, regular, through regular order with appropriate congressional notification and consultation. Um, and to your broader question, Camilla, through this entire period, um, since the onset of this administration, uh, Saudi Arabia has remained a close strategic partner of the United States, and we look forward to enhancing that partnership. We'll continue to work closely with the kingdom on preventing escalation in the Middle East, on a post-conflict plan for the Gaza Strip, as well as um, them continuing to play a role in finalizing a ceasefire uh, as it relates to the ongoing conflict. Uh, and, and, and since you've allowed me to, you know, to, to, to start on this topic, I, I will just note that, you know, meanwhile, the Houthis have proven once uh, again to be a group intent on using terror to its advance its agenda, including through tar the targeting of civilian um, shipping in the Red Sea. Uh, we, as the United States, are regularly conducting airstrikes to degrade Houthi capabilities, an effort that is ongoing and will continue together with the coalition of so, partners. So, so it is fair to just assume that this has happened now, that there's been an active lifting of this, given the tensions in the region with Iran and the No, 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 not, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm speaking about the bilateral relationship in a broad context, Camilla. This is a result of uh, strictly the policy as it relates to uh, the the ongoing conflict in Yemen and um, the the role that the kingdom played in, in, in maintaining their part of the agreement when this was initially um, set out at the onset of this administration. Um, yeah, go ahead. And then we'll wrap up with you after, Sean. Go ahead. It's in response to, to Yemen, but that's been, so been over two years since the truce was there. So what, what happened in the past? Did it take two years to, to verify that there Look, uh, John, these things um, are processes. They take time. Um, but uh, as, as you so note, uh, this policy was combined with intensive diplomacy, including uh, direct diplomacies with the Saudi on a path to winding down the war. Um, as you so know, in March of 2022, the uh, Saudis and Houthis entered into a truce under UN mediation. Um, and since then, there has not been a single Saudi air airstrike into Yemen and cross-border fire from Yemen into Saudi Arabia has largely stopped. Uh, we've also seen and uh, been able to uh, assess at a at closer detail that Saudi Arabia has implemented a number of improvements in civilian harm mitigation procedures, including modernizing its strike planning processes to align with U.S. processes and continuing to participate in a number of U.S.-led trainings and joint exercises. So, uh, as I said, they have uh, met their end of the deal, and this is us um, uh, holding uh, our end of the bargain as well. Can I just briefly go to Venezuela? Yeah, super um, fact. Go ahead. The, uh, um, uh, there's been reporting in the, the Wall Street Journal uh, saying that, that an amnesty has been offered or at least is in the pipeline for, for Maduro. Can you say, at least from the U.S. perspective, whether that's something that makes sense? That is uh, not true. We've not made any offers uh, of amnesty to Maduro or others since this election. Um, while you, since you've asked about uh, the topic, uh, Sean, let me just say that in uh, as it relates to Venezuela, we reject the increased violence, the unjust mass incarceration, and the repression directed at Venezuelans including members of the Democratic opposition. And you said the amnesty is not uh, being offered. It's not inaccurate. Uh, I mean, is there something in the cards, you know, from the that the United States is discussing with the opposition, for example, that they might make some sort of deal with Maduro? That you know, not look, Sean, I'm not gonna. Uh, I'm not. Say maybe amnesty is not the right word, but is there some some incentive? To I, I, I'm certainly not gonna read out the tea leaves of the process. As Secretary Blinken has said, now is the time for the Venezuelan parties to begin discussions on a respectful and peaceful transition in accordance with Venezuelan electoral law and the wishes of the Venezuelan people. Uh, the U.S. Uh, is concerned considering a range of, of options to pressure uh, Maduro to return Venezuela to a democratic path, and will continue to do so. But the responsibility is on Maduro uh, and Venator Venezuela's electoral authorities to come clean on the election results. All right, thanks everybody. Thanks guys.